Welcome back to the fourth installment of Strange and Interesting Fish. In this video, we're exploring eight incredible species. Like always, I'll cover their size, appearance, range, conservation status, and of course, the unique traits that make them stand out. The American eel is an incredible freshwater eel. The typical person might not recognize an eel as a fish, but they are indeed a fish, even though they are more snake-like in appearance. American eels can reach well over one meter or three feet in length, but most are under two feet. They have smooth, slimy skin, and their coloration is an olive green or brown on the back to a pale yellow or white on the belly. Their pectoral fins are small, and there are no pelvic fins. They have a single long dorsal fin running continuously into the tail, with the anal fin doing the same. You might be familiar with the term anadromous, which refers to a fish that lives the majority of its life in salt water, and then travels into freshwater habitats to reproduce. Salmon are probably the most well-known example of this life cycle. American eels, on the other hand, are catadromous, which is essentially the opposite of anadromous, meaning that these eels live the majority of their lives in freshwater, and will then travel hundreds or even thousands of miles to salt water to reproduce. This catadromous behavior is much more uncommon, with only about 0.2% of fish species worldwide exhibiting this life cycle. As mature females reach the open ocean, they will release up to 4 million buoyant eggs and then die. The tiny fertilized larvae will drift in ocean currents for months before metamorphosing into tiny transparent eels. These juvenile eels will then enter coastal waters and ascend into rivers and streams continuing their life in a freshwater environment. Once in freshwater, they'll transform into a more yellow pigmentation and grow for many years. When they reach maturity, usually around 6 to 20 years old, they develop a darker hue and hormonally are triggered into the migration back to the ocean. This remarkable journey and life cycle distinguishes American eels from almost all other species of fish. In freshwater ecosystems, they inhabit a wide variety of places, mostly rivers and lakes, but they are also found in coastal estuaries. Another fascinating detail about these fish is that they can spend more than an hour outside of the water and be totally fine, as they essentially breathe through their skin. In fact, American eels are known to squirm and slither across land from one body of water to another. Their range is broad, extending from northern Quebec all the way down the Atlantic coast into South America but they are notably found far inland as well. Ecologically, American eels are nocturnal generalists. They hide in the daytime in mud or under logs, and then will hunt crustaceans, insects, and fish at night. Humans historically harvested eels heavily as both food and bait. But perhaps a bigger problem, in more recent years, the construction of dams and barriers has blocked eel migration in many rivers, causing steep population declines. For example, eel numbers in Canada's St. Lawrence and Ottawa rivers have fallen dramatically due to obstacles and pollution. The American eel was classified as endangered in 2017. Efforts are now underway to restore eel passage and spawning success. The rainbow shiner is a small little fish native to the southeastern U.S., particularly the Mobile River Basin. Adults measure only 1.5 to 2.5 inches long, or 40 to 60 millimeters. This fish has a silvery body with a distinctive black lateral stripe along the sides, appearing somewhat normal for any freshwater minnow. However, in the breeding season, males explode into color. In my opinion, this fish has some of the most spectacular colors of any freshwater minnow. A rosy purple or pink stripe appears above the lateral dark band, and their fins and flanks turn iridescent blue to violet, with the upper half of the eye sometimes glowing bright red. These fish will school up in large groups, turning the water an iridescent pink color. This is something that I really hope to see in person someday. The color pink is just not something that you see in many fish. Rainbow shiners live in clear, cool headwater streams with gravelly or sandy riffles and pools. They are typically found in Alabama and Georgia streams and have since spread into Tennessee. Their range is really quite small. These shiners feed largely on aquatic insects, especially midge larvae. They spawn in the late spring and early summer when the water is around 61 to 77 degrees Fahrenheit. 
Unique among most minnows, rainbow shiners often deposit eggs on the gravelly nests built by other fish, such as the horny head chub. Each fish typically lives for about two years with two possible spawning seasons. Rainbow shiners belong to the minnow family Leucicidae, making them relatives of many shiners and dace across the continent. Though not of major economic importance, they're noted in ichthyology for their communal spawning behavior and are popular in the native fish aquarium hobby. They are currently considered as a species of low conservation concern. Heading to the deserts of the west, to a very different environment, there is a leucistid in the same family as the rainbow shiner, the virgin spine dace. This small silvery minnow has a special place in my heart because before I was really into fish and fishing, I was exploring a creek in southwestern Utah with a dip net, actually looking for toads at the time, and I unintentionally scooped up a silvery little fish with a terminal mouth and light speckling. At the time I had no idea what it was and it made me so curious. This then led me to do some research and I learned of the virgin spine dace, which is now one of my favorite fish of the desert. Adult virgin spine dace reach 2 to 5 inches long, or 6 to 12 centimeters long. They have a silvery body with a pattern of sooty blotches or spots along each side. Their dorsal fin has 8 rays with 2 stout spines, and the anal fin has about 9 rays. Breeding males become more colorful, and they can develop orange-red bands on their paired fins, and a gold spot on the gill cover. Overall, the fish has a typical leucicid or minnow look, but these faint speckles and fin colorations can help distinguish it. Virgin spine dace inhabit relatively shallow streams in the desert of the Virgin River Basin, found only in the Virgin River system of southwestern Utah, northwestern Arizona, and southern Nevada. Unlike some other minnows, spine dace tolerate warm water quite well. They can survive in temperatures of up to 84 degrees Fahrenheit or 29 degrees Celsius. They are typically found in pools and slow runs over sand and gravel substrates. The virgin spine dace is genetically distinct from other spine dace, reflecting its isolation in the Virgin River Basin. Other members of this genus include the endangered Moapa and the White River spine dace. This fish is of a high conservation concern due to its extremely limited range. By 1994, suitable habitat was reduced to about 60% of its historical area and around that time it was proposed for federal protection as threatened. It now currently ranks as vulnerable. The freshwater drum, also commonly known as sheep's head, is a stout silvery gray fish widespread in North American waters. It has a deep compressed body with a humped back. Adults typically weigh five to 15 pounds or two to seven kilograms, though the world record was a 54 pound monster proving that this fish can get very big. Coloration is silvery gray, sometimes bronze or brown. The drum's dorsal fin is split into two parts, the first with 10 stout spines and the second with about 30 soft rayed fins. Its pectoral fins are elongated and pointed, and a continuous lateral line extends to the tail. Inside its mouth, it has powerful pharyngeal teeth used for crushing prey, which can be anything from fish to crayfish and mussels. Unique among freshwater fish, male drums have specific muscles on their swim bladder, and during the spawning season, they vibrate these muscles to produce a loud drumming sound, which you can hear in this audio clip. Freshwater drum are the only North American freshwater member of the croaker family. Their range is quite broad as they occur from Hudson Bay all the way down through the Mississippi and Great Lake Basins as far south as Central America. East to west, they reach from the Appalachians all the way to the Great Plains. This expansive range makes them one of the most wide-ranging freshwater fish of North America. In terms of relatives, the freshwater drum has many close kin that are species of marine fish, such as other drums and croakers, like the red drum, the black drum, the Atlantic croaker, or the weak fish. Freshwater drum are of little conservation concern as they are currently abundant in their range. In the second video of this series, we talked about the Mexican cave tetra. And as it turns out, 
That's only one of a few blind cave species found in Mexico. And I think that the Mexican blind Bratula is even weirder. When I first saw a picture of this fish, my initial thought was that it looked like a dead fish that was partially decomposed. This unusual cave fish is a colorless, eyeless, live-bearing fish endemic to the Yucatan Peninsula of Mexico. Adults reach around 4 inches in length or 10 centimeters long, with a head that is flattened and scaleless. They possess no eyes, but instead have specialized sensory organs to detect vibrations in the dark waters. They have a long dorsal and anal fin running along most of the body. Their skin completely lacks pigment, giving the fish the translucent, almost pinkish-white appearance. These fish are the sole member of their genus and are the only cave fishes in their family. In fact, most of this family is found in salt water in the deep ocean. This fish inhabits the freshwater sections of underground water-filled sinkholes and aquifers in the Yucatan Peninsula. Water temperature here is a constant 73 to 80 degrees Fahrenheit or 23 to 27 degrees Celsius. This fish is essentially a top predator in these subterranean waters, feeding on crustaceans like cave shrimps. Remarkably, females give birth to up to a dozen live young between December and February. Newborn fry are only 2 to 3 centimeters in length. This fish is currently classified as near threatened. Threats include water pollution since its aquifer is below populated areas and sewage contaminants can seep in its extremely limited range. Also found on the Yucatan Peninsula is the Yucatan Molly, also called the giant sailfin molly. This is a large, live bearing fish that lives in the coastal waters of the Yucatan Peninsula. It has an oblong, robust body, and males have an enormous, almost ridiculous, cell like dorsal fin. Full grown adults usually exceed 4 inches or 10 centimeters, and large, wild females can often reach over 8 inches or 20 centimeters, making this the largest of all the molly species. Wild Yucatan mollies are typically silvery or olive gray, though captive strains in the pet trade may include many color variants. This species belongs to the same live bearing family as guppies and other mollies. Yucatan mollies inhabit freshwater and brackish lagoons and estuaries of the Yucatan coast. They tolerate moderately salty water and warmer temperatures. In the wild, they feed on algae, detritus, and small invertebrates. They are often found on mats of aquatic vegetation. Females from 6 to 9 years old internally produce around 34,000 to 66,000 eggs per spawn. Males court the females by flaring that large dorsal fin in display. After fertilization, development is internal and laborsome, similar to guppies but on a larger scale. Yucatan mollies are prized for their dramatic fins and are a hardy tropical brackish species, but as a pet they do require spacious tanks and good aeration due to their size. Because they've been selectively bred into many color strains in the aquarium hobby, the wild type large size forms are now actually pretty rare in captivity. The conservation status of this species is listed as vulnerable. The Arctic grayling is similar to the Yucatan molly in that it has a large dorsal fin, but as far as the environment in which it's found, it's very different. As you may have guessed from the name, the Arctic grayling is found in the very far north of North America. This fish is a salmonid, meaning that it's related to salmon, trout, and whitefish. There are about 14 species of grayling on Earth, but the Arctic grayling is the only grayling native to the Americas. This fish has a slender body, a forked tail, and a more scaly appearance than trout or salmon. Its most distinguishing feature is by far the spectacular sail-like dorsal fin, which often has brilliant blue markings. Its back is a dark bluish gray, and its sides are silvery with a pattern of V-shaped spots. Breeding males become especially colorful. Their pelvic fins may turn pink or orange, with those bright blue spots becoming even more vibrant on the dorsal fin. Sometimes these fish even develop a purplish hue. Arctic grayling are usually found around 10 to 20 inches, or 25 to 50 centimeters, but the world record was actually at a length of 30 inches, or 76 centimeters. These fish have been recorded living over 20 years, and they mature around 1 to 4 years old. In North America, it is widespread in cold northern waters, and its native range covers the Arctic and Pacific draining rivers in Alaska, Canada, and Montana. 
Its historic range also included parts of Michigan, but these original native populations were declared extirpated from the state in the 1930s. Arctic grayling have since been introduced back into Michigan and many other states throughout the country, especially in the West. These fish occupy clear, cold rivers and lakes, usually at very high elevations, in water between 46 to 50 degrees Fahrenheit or 8 to 11 degrees Celsius. Arctic grayling spawn in the spring in flowing riffles, and males use that dorsal fin to perform an elaborate courtship. A female grayling will broadcast eggs straight into the current, unlike trout, which typically excavate nests. In fact, the frantic courtship display often stirs up sand and gravel, helping bury the fertilized eggs naturally. Thankfully, this is a species of least concern, and they are considered secure overall. However, portions of their southern populations have declined. Also being a Salmonid, the bull trout is a relative of the Arctic grayling, this time belonging to the char family. This means that it's more closely related to brook trout, lake trout, dolly varden, and Arctic char. The bull trout is native to cold streams of western North America, as far south as Idaho and far north into Canada. This fish was long confused with its relative, the Dolly Varden, but it's now recognized as its own species. Physically, bull trout have light colored spots on a dark background, with distinctive white fin margins like the other char species. Relative to the other char and trout species, it has a very large head and mouth. Adults can reach over 40 inches or 100 centimeters in length, and they can weigh as much as 32 pounds or 14.5 kilograms. However, the majority of bull trout are much smaller than that. Size and color may vary, as migratory bull trout are often silvery with faint spots, and stream resident fish show more of an olive or brown hue. Bull trout are found in cold, clear waters of high mountains and coastal river systems of the northwest of North America. This includes parts of Alaska, Yukon, British Columbia, Alberta, and the Pacific Northwest as far south as Idaho. Historically, they ranged into Northern California as well, but they are now likely extirpated from that area. Bull trout require very specific habitat, typically water below 55 degrees Fahrenheit or 13 degrees Celsius, with complex cover like logs and undercut banks. They need clean gravel for spawning and connected waterways for movement. They are the apex predators of many trout streams, with some populations migrating between lakes and tributaries. There are also populations of coastal bull trout that have anadromous runs like steelhead. In the continuous U.S., bull trout are listed as a threatened species under the Endangered Species Act, and they are globally listed as vulnerable. Declines have occurred due to habitat loss, fragmentation, hybridization, and competition with non-native species. Today, conservation plans focus on reconnecting streams and protecting cold water habitats so that bull trout populations can recover in their native rivers. I find any of the lesser known trout and char to just be fascinating, and bull trout is one that I have hopes to see someday. Hey everybody, thank you so much for watching that video. This is part four of a series that I'm going to continue for a long time, so if you enjoyed this video, please subscribe. I also have videos on the species of species of North America, so if you like anything about fish, please consider doing that for me. It helps out a lot. Thank you so much, and I'll see you on the next one.